So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to explain the last part when it comes to stress analysis. So similar to the midterm problem, this is like what you're going to see in real life. I mean, if you left this class and you went to the office, any design office, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to have a beam, like for example, the one above me, you have a loads from above. So for this beam, you're going to draw the shear force diagram, bending moment diagram, and then you're going to figure out where is the maximum shear that's going to happen in the beam at which location. So for this case, it was 31, so at this location. And for the bending moment, you're going to have the maximum bending moment happened at that location. And this is the steps not only in class. This is what you're going to do in any design office, whether you are a structural engineer or mechanical engineer. Once you figure out what is the maximum forces, you're going to go and do a stress analysis. And you want to find whether the cross section within different part of the cross section it is safe or no. That's why we draw the shear stress distribution. So normal stress distribution here. And we found, for example, that the maximum normal stress distribution was 44. And the allowable was 45. So we are safe in terms of normal stress, normal stresses. When it comes to shear stresses, the allowable was 20. When you drew it, you found that the maximum happened here, and it was 4.9. So now, you are, now it's safe when it comes to stresses. And this is what we call a strength check. And this is, again, what you're going to do in real life. But what is missing that you're going to take in advanced class is how you come up from the first time with the dimensions that are going to be safe in everything. But is this what you're going to do in real life or in design offices? No. At the beginning, you're going to assume dimensions. So among the, the engineers, we know, for example, commonly or practically, the height of the beam, it depends on its span. So if this is, for example, a five meter beam above me, for example, it's common among engineers that the height, it will be the length of the beam over 10. That's like the most common. So I know now, without designing it, I know that the approximate height of this beam above me, if it's five meter long, I will say five over 10, which is, for example, 500 centimeter over 10. So I know that the height is going to be 50 centimeter, and this will be fine. What about the depth? We usually start with 25 centimeter. So at the beginning, without even doing any calculation, I know the dimensions. You put those dimensions here, the first assumed dimension, calculate the stresses, find whether it's safe or no. If it's unsafe, you know. If it's unsafe in shear, you know that you need to increase the width. If it's unsafe in normal stresses, you know that you need to increase the inertia. So now, as if I give you the map of how you approach the design without even doing any calculations. You had questions? At the beginning, you and the architect and the owner agree, agrees on the type of material. For example, in Egypt, we have the concrete is very cheap. So usually we do concrete. In the United States, timber is very cheap. So mostly, you will do timber. Timber, for example, in the Middle East is expensive, so expensive because we have pores there. So it depends on where you are. And at the beginning of the project, you and the architect and the owner agrees on the type of material. And it's hard for, for you to change. That's why some of you, when we had, in, in the midterm, when I show you a beam that broke in the bending, some of you said we're going to change the material. That's correct. Some of you sh said we're going to change the dimension. We're going to increase it. That's correct. And some of you also said, why don't we add the support in the middle? That is also correct. And I give you all the full mark in that. But sometimes for this beam, for example, at the middle, you're going to have the maximum, for example, deflection or maximum whatever. It is hard in some cases, to add column. So is it possible to add column in the middle of this beam? No, it's going to obstruct the view. Yet it's correct, but not, not, it's not usually the correct approach. You either increase the inertia, you either change the material, but also changing the material, sometimes it's, it's hard to do it. So the perfect answer is the inertia. Play with the inertia, which means play with the dimension, increase the dimension, and so on. So once you made sure that the strength is safe, there is another thing that you need to check, which we call it surfaceability check. And this is basically the deflection. So there is a lot of ways that you can calculate the deflection. You have the moment area method, double integration, conjugate beam, virtual work, and the list goes on. 
and each method takes like two to three lectures. In this class, we're not going to do any of them. I'm going to leave it for advanced classes because you're going to take it in great detail in advanced classes. But I want you to know that I prepared you and I gave you the basics so that you can easily understand these lessons in the future. And the, the assumption that all these methods based on, that the deflection is small, and also the stresses remains in the elastic region. So if you understand from lecture one, we focused on, we want to have the stresses in the linear elastic region so that when it deflects, it returns back to its original position. So I'm applying load, it's elastically deflecting, but when I remove the load, it goes back to original position. The reason why it goes back to its original position because I applied stresses within its elastic region. So those deflection gonna be elastically deflected, which means if I remove the load, it's gonna go back to its original position. So after we calculate the deflection, what's our limits? And again, it depends on the country that you're working in. For example, in the United States, for live load, and this is in the codes, in the live load, the deflection shouldn't inc be more than L over 360, which is the length of the beam over 360. So for example, if I have a beam like this, and I give you that the live load is 15, and, and you have different type of loads. You have live load, dead load, snow load, wind load. Live load is basically the load that's going to be here for a while and leave, like people, for example. So this floor feels a live load of this certain number of people. But the shares here are dead load, which means it's going to stay here from the day one until we demolish this building. So I'm gonna, just going to tell you that the maximum deflection for this beam, so this beam, you have a distributed load, and you just like, trust me in this, it's going to deflect like this. And the maximum deflection is going to happen in the middle, and this is the equation for the maximum deflection. And I'm going to explain it in, in details in a couple of slides. But let me just write it now, just to give you a sense of, of for what we're going to do. So to get the maximum deflection, we need to multiply 5 times the W, which is the load, distributed load, times L over 4 over 384 EI. You're going to get 16 inches. OK? Is 16 inches OK or no? Again, it depends on the country. So in, if you are designing, for example, this beam, so we know that the code allow us, for the allowable, it should be L, which is the length of the beam, 20 foot, multiplied by 12 to convert it to inches, over 360. I'm going to get a deflection of 0.9 inches. So although it might be safe stresses, but is, it is unsafe serviceability. So that means it's eventually going to be unsafe, it's going to be rejected, and you need to redesign this beam. But I want you to notice something. This load will cause the beam to deflect. And to make it safe, you need to play with E and I. E and I, which is the modulus of elasticity, which is the material, and then I is the moment of inertia. And moment of inertia here for this beam, for example, so this beam will bend around x. So the moment of inertia is around x, and ix is parallel perpendicular cube over 12 plus, plus a d square. The most effective solution that you want to increase the height of this beam, because you have this beam bending around x. But if you have wind load, so the beam will bend around y. So the, the perfect solution that you want to increase the dimension that's perpendicular to the axis of bending. Because the moment of inertia is parallel perpendicular cube over 12. If you increase the perpendicular dimension, you're going you're gonna to increase the moment of inertia by cube. Unlike if you increase, for example, the dimension that's parallel to the axis of bending, which is width, it's going to affect it's going to affect it, but not as much as the other dimension. Okay, so this beam is unsafe, although it might be safe stresses, but it's unsafe. And if you if you walk with, like if you, for example, the engineer who's above you didn't see this in real life, it's going to be something like this. The building didn't fail, but it deflects like so much, the deflection here is so much, and you're going to be scared walking underneath it. That's why it's, 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 a, it's important just to limit the deflection. Although you see it's the safest stresses, it didn't fail, but it deflected too much. 
you don't know what's above here, the type of float, for example, there is a tank up here, I don't know what, what above here. One. I don't know, but like this is too much. And it is for people, it's like people will be scared to walk underneath it. So for example, the video that I always show you, if you're in the stadium and you see this, you'll be scared standing underneath it because it might turn bad. So this is didn't fail. And if you notice, this is like elastic deflection because people jump. So when people jump, it deflects. When people just like jump, oh sorry, when people like jump and stay on it, it deflects. When people jump again, it goes back to its original position. So it's elastic deflection. It is safe and everything, but this is a huge deflection. And sometimes it can be worse, like what happened here. So it's deflecting and eventually it failed. Okay? So that's why it's important. Yeah, it's still they, they're still celebrating. Yeah, they're, they're Germans, so. <laughs> so it's important to limit the deflection, not because the people will be scared to be in this, but it might be dangerous so that like this might fail, okay? And if it fails, where are you gonna go? You're gonna go to jail. Okay. The deflection is not, it's not a new concept that I introduced to you. I introduced in lecture two. But in lecture two, the beam didn't bend. And instead, it was an axial deformation. So we know that delta, which is the deflection, it's FL over AE, which is force length over AE. And then I want you to notice, in the axial deformation, what was the resistance here? The resistance in the actual deformation, it wasn't E and I, and it said it was A and E. The reason why there is no inertia, because from the lecture of the moment of inertia, the moment of inertia is resistant to bending. And there is no bending here, it is just axial. That's why we call this axial rigidity. So an axial rigidity is A times E, and that's the resistance, and this is the stiffness due to the material, which is E, and then a, which is stiffness due to the shape of the material. So that's for the axial deformation. But when we talk about bending, the resistance is no longer A, time, A times E. And instead, what, what I introduced in lecture 13, that when beam bend, it bend in like a circular shape. And then we came up with this equation, which is the rho, which is the radius of curvature m over i equal e over rho. And if I put it, the one over rho in one side, I will come up with this. So one over rho, which is the curvature of the beam, is equal to m over ei. And again, if I want to limit how the beam gonna curve or gonna bend, that's why I need to play around with ei. So the resistance when it comes to bending, it is e times i, which is the moment of inertia. So it's not old, it's not old, so it's not new. I introduced this concept before. And this equation, it's going to be the base for all the, the, the methods that you're going to use for calculating the deflection. So I gave you the basics. So when you go to the advanced classes, you're going to be, I hope you, it's easy for you to understand because all these methods are going to start with this formula. Okay, the radius of curvature depends on the moment, of course, which is the load, and then over EI, which is the resistance, which is the stiffness due to the material, and now stiffness due to the shape, which is in terms of I, which is the moment of inertia. And the EI term, we call it flexural rigidity. So we have two rigidity here. We have axial rigidity, and we have flexural rigidity. Okay? So what we're going to use, are we going to use any of the methods that I mentioned? No. We're going to use tables. So the table, we have two pages. And this two pages covers the most common loads and the supports that we're going to use to get the deflection. So here is the table. This table is in the references, and it's also in the codes, so that engineers can use. I mean, of, of, although you're going, to under, you're going to take the method for deflection advanced classes, but trust me, when you graduate, you're going to use this table. I mean, I've, I've been using this table even for the report that I, when I design a building, I have to 
produce something we call calculation sheet, which is a report of the design of each beam in the building. So I take the deflection from the software and I verify it with this table. Okay? So this table, you're going to stick with it for a long time. So this table has two pages. First page is for simply supported beam, and then the other page for cantilever beam. Cantilever beam means a beam, it is supported from one side. And let me show it, show it to you in real life. It is something like this. So you have a column. Oh, I don't know if you see it. But here is like a beam that is fixed in the column and it's free from the other side. I don't know if you see it. Do you see it? You don't see it, right? Okay, never mind. Okay. So the table has simply supported beam and has cantilever beams. So first of all, you need to identify the type of beam that you're working with. And then match the loading scenario that you have in, the, in, in your beam with, anyone, with any of these scenarios in the table. Okay? So let me tell you how, this, how you work with this table. So you have a beam, something like this, whether it's, for example, this is the beam. Let's say it's simply supported, which means supported from both sides with roller and or hinge. Okay? And from the far left, you have the origin. So the y-axis, it's not y, it's, we're going to call it v because that's wh what we symbolize the deflection. So we symbolize the deflection with v. And then the horizontal axis here, it is x. Okay? Let me... So x here is the distance along the longitudinal axis of the beam. Okay? And as you can see, from the far left, it is 0, 0 here. The V here is the vertical deflection of the beam. As, as you can see, and as you can see, the positive, it is up, which means if the def beam deflected that way, the deflection here is going to be positive. If beam deflected downwards, that means the deflection is negative. Okay? So, for example, if I give you a beam like this, and I give you a load in the middle, P, and I ask you three questions. What is the deflection at point A? What is the deflection at point B? What is the deflection at point C? And I gave you the dimension here, for example. For example, this is one meter. This is 2.5 meter. And then at C, it is four meter. OK? First of all, you're going to see the, the support of the beam. So this is simply supported. So I know I'm, I'm in the first page. I look at the load. I have a load in the middle. So I will go to the case one. Not case two, but case one. Because case two, as you can see, the load is shifted. OK. So now, as you can see, the origin is here. You have V, you have X. I will just explain now the last two columns, and the first column I'm going to explain in the next slide. So the, first the second column is the maximum deflection. So the maximum deflection happens in the middle. So if I want to find the deflection in the middle, I can go to this equation. But if I want to find the deflection at anywhere within the beam, I need to go to the elastic curve, which is a general equation that you can find the deflection at any point in a beam within the condition that's given to here. OK? So you can use this equation to calculate the deflection at L over 2. And you can use this equation to also calculate the deflection at L over 2. They're going to be the same. But, and it's a common mistake, if I ask you here, for example, find me the deflection at point A. So point A, I have x equal to 1 you can't use this equation. And instead, you want to use this equation, and you're going to substitute in x here equal to what? 1. OK? And for point B, which is at the mid-span, you can either use this one, 
or you can use this equation. But what x are you going to use here? 2.5. Lastly, which, which is the part that's tricky here, point C, which is 4 meters from, from this side and 1 meter from the other side. But if you look at the condition, because you always need to read the condition, this equation is only valid from, from 0 to L over 2, which is in that region. But what if I want to calculate the deflection at some point here? You go from the other side. And the reason why you go from the other side, because as you see, first of all, it is symmetric. So the, this point here, it is same as this point here. So you can either, this distance is 1, so you can either solve from 1 here, or you can put the origin this side and find distance 1. So you can work from the other side. For some condition, it's tricky. For example, for this condition, where you have a beam and a bending moment, if I ask you to calculate the, the the deflection at the middle, the most common mistake that you go and substitute in that equation. This is wrong because the maximum deflection for this beam doesn't, have in the, doesn't happen in the middle, and instead it happened here. So V max happened at x equal L1 minus root 3 over 3. So it's important that you, not, you, don't, you don't blindly substitute in the equation, you need to read the condition. If you have same condition, then you can go ahead and substitute in that equation. Okay? What if, instead of having P looking down, I'm having P looking up? The equation is going to be the same. The sign. And if you, if you use the sign, I, I, I mean, like, it's, it's okay, but I prefer that you just eliminate all the signs. And instead, write an arrow here. For example, if the beam deflected down, put an arrow looking down, which is like deflecting down. If the beam deflects up, put an arrow up. So you don't bother with the sign. But if you want to use the sign, I already told you the method. OK? So the first row was the slope. And we call this slope either slope deflection or angle of rotation, which is simply the beam, how the beam is bending. I mean, like, when I apply load in the middle, the beam has an angle here. This angle we call the angle of rotation, which is the angle from the tangent of the curve, because we agreed now that the beam bends in a curve, the elastic curve. We make a tangent at the point we want to find the theta at. We make a tangent, and the angle from that tangent to the longitudinal axis of the beam which is the undeformed longitudinal axis of the beam, that's your angle, OK? And again, it has a sign convention, clockwise or counterclockwise, which one is positive, which one is negative. I don't you to want you to bother. But if you want to find theta 1, the beam bent clockwise. So next to your answer, it is in radian. And tell me it's clockwise or counterclockwise. So I don't want you to use the sign. And instead, just use the arrow and clockwise or counterclockwise. OK? So this is the slope deflection. So for example, these two simple beams, if I want to find the deflection, you first of all, for this part, this beam I have simply supported load in the middle. I will go here. And OK, now I'm working with case 1. So I want to draw, first of all, the elastic curve. The elastic curve is the deflection of the beam. OK? It's not great, but like it serves the purpose. And then I want you to find, for example, the VA and theta, for example, at B. Can you do that? Yeah, you're going to go to the table. You found. PL cube over 48 EI. And then for the theta, theta 1 is equal to theta 2. And it's both of them is equal to PL squared over 16 EI. And it's basically plug and chug. The plug and chug part is the easy part. 
the hardest part is like where to navigate the beam or where to navigate this condition. I just gave you now the easiest part, like the easiest examples, which is when you have a load in the middle or distributed load. And in the exam or in the homework or in real life, you're going to have a combination. And I'm going to explain that in a moment. But as long as you understood how to navigate for, for the easiest condition, I hope it will be easy for you to navigate the harder condition. So last thing, or before the last, so what is the deflection and rotation at the support? And before going through this, I want to remind you, or I want you to remind me, how many reactions did we have at the fixation? Three. X, Y, and then moment. When you have a reaction, that means that this point is not allowed to move in the reaction direction. So if I have a reaction vertically, that means at point A, the deflection is zero. And if there is a moment, that means it's not allowed to rotate. That means theta A is equal to zero. OK? That's a very common question that you're going to see. Tell me. For the fixation, what is the V and what is the theta? And most of you do calculations and all this kind of stuff when it's, it's just zero. OK? For a, roll, for, for a hinge or for a hinge like this, I have two reactions. I don't have moment, which means the rotation at A is going to have a value, and you're going to find it from the table. But the vertical deflection at A is going to be zero because you have a reaction in there. Same as this, I have vertical reaction. I don't have moment, so theta A going to have a value. But VA going to be equal to 0. And just an illustration to this. So for the pin support, when you have a hinge like this or a pin, we have vertical reaction. We have horizontal reaction. So you don't have any movement in both sides. And when it rotates, it's going to rotate like this. So you have a rotation. You don't have any horizontal, horizontal movement or vertical movement. But when we go to the roller, the roller is allowed to move in the horizontal and it's allowed to rotate. That's why you're going to see it like this. And this is most common. You're going to see it in the bridges. This is like the bearing in the bridges. OK? And lastly, the fixation. I want you to notice at the beginning, there is no any movement here, or there is no any rotation here. The rotation starts picking up later, but away from the fixation. Okay? And in the design classes, you're going to know which one to use when. Okay? Okay. Now let's go to the concept of the superposition. So sometimes the loading scenario is not in the table. So what should you do? You just break it apart, which means I only have in the table, in the table, if you look in the table, this is a cantilever. I don't have both distributed load and point load at the same time. What I only have, I have distributed load alone and point load alone. So that superposition here will be a mix between case 7 and case 10. OK? So what I want you to do here, I want you to say, for this condition or this loading scenario, you want to say that I do have a mix between the loading case that is only distributed load and then a point load at the end. And if I want to find the deflection at point A, like I asked you here, for this load case, this beam going to bend like this. And I'm going to ask you that, draw the, the elastic curve or the deflection of the beam. So this is VA from that load case. And if you look up in the table, at the very end of the distributed load or the point load, that's where the maximum happen. So you can easily use both maximum equation and add them together. OK? And this one 
it's going to be up. Uh, when I say add, I mean it's like algebraic addition. Because for this load case, I want to say 1 and 2, the total deflection at A is going to be VA1, which is down, and then you have VA2, which is up. So you need to subtract them and find me the deflection, whether up or down. So you're going to eventually subtract them. Okay? If they are in the same, like if they are deflecting down, then you're going to add them. If they are deflecting up, then you're going to subtract them. Okay? Also, I'm asking you here, find the angle of rotation at point A. So at point A here, this is point A. The angle of rotation is the angle from the tangent that you create from how the beam deflects and the longitudinal axis of the beam, which is in this case is Z. And this is your angle. Okay? This is the original axis of the beam, and that's why it deflects clockwise. So you first of all identify whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. You have a problem or it's okay? Understood? Okay. And then if you want to find this theta, you're going to go to that table, and theta is here, so you're going to use this equation, PL squared over 2 EI. One of them is going to be clockwise. The other one here, if I extend this line and make the horizontal, this one is counterclockwise. So you also, for A, one of them is going to be clockwise, the other one is going to be counterclockwise, so you want to subtract them, and then you're going to find me the answer, whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise. So this is now the concept of superposition. And again, all the equations that you saw in the table, it will be, I think, the first assignment in all these advanced classes that will go through the deflection methods that you want to verify all these equations. Okay? So those equations are a conclusion from the method, from the deflection method that you're going to take later. Okay? So someone did the job for us and came up with those equations, which is just the most common that are used. Okay? So now, let's do an example. So, we have a cantilever, and we are asked to calculate the deflection at point C, which is at the very end, using the principle of the superposition. So the beam is square with dimensions 8.5 times 8.5. So here is the beam. Here is the moment of inertia. Here is the model of elasticity. And I recommend that at the beginning, you multiply E times I to get the flexural rigidity so that you have it in a one value and you're going to use it in all the equations that come. But now I want to ask you, do I have this condition in the table? Wait. Look in the table. Do I have a distributed load that goes halfway through, or I only have a distributed load that's all, way, like, all the way? All the way. So what you need to do, first of all, I'm going to take case 10, and I'm going to take case 7. So I have two cases now. So let me start with case 10, and let me tell you how can we approach this. So for case 10, I have only a distributed load like this. Okay? And we have two kip per foot, and I do have a length of six feet. Okay? From the table, this beam is gonna deflect something like this. Right? I can get this deflection, and I can get the rotation that's going to happen here. Right? That's easy. So from the table, so the V, which is again, this is not at the very end, this is at point B. Okay? So V at point B, from the table, it is W L power 4 over 8 EI. 
So W now is equal to 2. It is kep over foot, so I want to convert it to kep over inches, so I want to multiply by 1 over 12. The length, some people, and it's a common mistake, will take the whole length. No. The length from the table, it only covers the distributed load. So you only take the 6 foot. So you want to say 6, I'll multiply by 12 to convert it to inches, and the whole thing to the power 4. And then 8. And then instead of multiplying E and I, I already did that here. I'm just going to put the 1.26 times 10 power 7. And you're going to get 0.0444 inches. And the question is going to be, is it up or down? It's down. OK? Let's get the theta B. So the theta is going to be WL power 3 over 6EI. Again, substituting the equation, and you're going to get 0.000823 radian. And is it clockwise or counterclockwise? It's clockwise. OK, so what I want now, what I wanted is not the deflection at point B. What I wanted was the deflection at point C. So what are you going to do? Tell me. Say, say that again. So the, the, the shear at the end doesn't affect the question if he is only the distributed load. Correct. No, no, say that again. I don't understand. Oh, okay. So, so the, um, because we have another force acting on that beam, correct? Yeah, but we are dividing. We are using the superposition. So, so we. That for the whole beam, yeah. the deflection at B is only due to the distributed load. Is that correct? It's also due to the point load. So if I have a beam like this, and I, I put a point load at the end, what happened to point B? You add, you add them. Okay, okay. But here's the part. I'm not interested in point B. So what should I do? So the beam extend another four foot here. OK? So what I want you to do, I found this theta. And what you're going to do, you're going to create a triangle here. And this triangle, you have the theta for it. And you have four foot here. Can you find this deflection? Yeah. How? That's correct. So it is 10. Because you have the theta. So 10 inverse theta is equal this over that. Right? So you can say 10 inverse of that theta, which is 0. 0.000. 8, 2, 3, and it's radian. So I want you to, to convert it to degrees. So 180 over pi is equal to the deflection, I want to call it now, just V star, and V star here over 4 foot. And I'm applied by 12 to convert it to inches. And since this angle is very, very small, you can just simply say 0.000823 is equal to V over 4 times 12, and both of them, you're going to get the same answer. And what you're going to get is 0.0395. And the question going to be, is this the final deflection at point C or no? no. What you need to do? That's correct. Because the deflection at C, it consists of two things. The deflection at B, which most of the people most of the time forget, and then the V star. OK? So if I want to find the final deflection, VC, you're going to say 0 0.0395, and it's looking down, plus 0 0.0444, and it's also looking down. So the final deflection is going to be 0 0.0839 inches, and it pointing down. Is this all? Tell me. That's correct. That's what we are missing now. So we did case 10. We need to do case 7. 
which is going to be straightforward because we have this condition in the table. We have a point load at the end, and we have a length now is equal to 10 foot. Do we have this condition in the table? Yeah, yeah which is case 7. So you can substitute in the Vmax right away. It's given P. The length of the beam is 10, 3 EI. If you did that, you're going to fi find that V at C for load case 7 is equal to PL power 3 over 3 EI. And then if you substitute, you're going to find 0.5485 inches. Should you leave the question and leave? You need to add them all. So the V total at C is going to be 0.5485 and then plus 0.0395. And then you're going to eventually get 0.6 inches looking down. Tell me. You're correct. There is an 8 here. Okay? And here is your final deflection. Okay? This example is just an extra. There is no, this is like because it involves a lot of math, but I just want you to give you the idea because you're going to need it when you, for example, graduate. So if you have a beam like this and you have two point loads, so you all agree with me now, it's a superposition. So we have this beam where we have a load in the middle, and we have another beam where we have the load shifted. So I can draw the elastic curve for both of them using the table. And again, I'm going to ask you in the exam, draw the elastic curve or draw the deflection. That's why you need to figure out how to approach the table correctly, because you're just basically going to copy the, the deflection from the curve. So I ask you in the question, find the location of the and the value of the maximum deflection. And again, this is not going to be in the exam or assignment or anything. This is just for your information. The maximum deflection, if we only have this point load, is going to be underneath it. But when we added another load, the deflection for this load condition is going to be underneath that load. So somewhere between here and here, that's where the maximum deflection is going to happen. But where? So what you need to do, get the Vx, or the equation for the elastic curve for one of them, and the equation for the elastic curve for the other one, OK? And add them together. Everything is known in this equation but the x. So you have an equation that is the equation of v, the deflection equation, is only a function of x. And from calculus, if you want to find the maximum deflection, what you want to do to that equation, you want to take the derivative, right? If you took the derivative and said the derivative equal to 0, that's where you're going to find the x where the maximum deflection happens. Take this x and substitute in that equation. And you're going to get the maximum deflection. Is that clear? Another example, which is not hard, and this, this is might be just like to, to, to prepare you, if you have a beam like this, now that's when I, I will see the creativity of each one. So if you have a beam like this, and we don't have in the table the, a beam that's like a part missing, and then you have a distributed load, one possible solution that you can say, OK, I'm going to use this one, and then I'm going to subtract from it that one. OK? As if I assume that there is a load here, and then in this condition, I just found the deflection due to this fake load, and I'll subtract it from here. Is that clear? There's not only the possible solution, there is other possible solution. But as long as you know how to navigate the table, how to approach the table, that's when you can play around with it. Is that clear? Tell me. That's, th that will be wrong, because both of them has different, different curve. So look. Well, it's 
So seven and ten. So you can because if you converted the, the, this distributed load to a point load, it's gonna be like a point in the middle. But this is also wrong because if I have a beam like this and I apply the point load, so this is different than if I have a distributed load on it. And you can also see why. You can calculate the Vmax here that happened in here and compare it to that Vmax. They're not the same. That's why you can do this. Okay? Is that clear? Any questions? Okay, that's all what I have, and I'm going to see you tomorrow. <laughs>